This video lecture will cover the two forms of energy, both kinetic energy and potential energy. Our learning outcome for this lecture is fairly straightforward. By the end of it, you should be able to describe the two forms of energy, both kinetic energy and potential energy. We know that life needs energy, and almost all life on this planet gets its energy from the sun. And we can thank cyanobacteria for evolving the ability to do photosynthesis. They can take the energy in sunlight and store it in carbohydrates, and then animals like ourselves, we come along and we eat plants or other animals, and we harvest the energy and other organic molecules through a process called cellular respiration. And to remind ourselves, energy is the ability to do work, and of course, the laws of thermodynamics, they govern energy transformations. So how do we transfer energy from kinetic energy to potential energy? And that's something we'll get to by the end of this lecture. Most of us know the two forms of energy. The first one, of course, is kinetic energy, which lightning is a form of kinetic energy, and the other one is potential energy, and ATP is an example of energy that's stored. We're going to go into more in depth about exactly what kinetic energy is and potential energy. So kinetic energy, that is the energy an object possesses due to its motion. So an object in motion, it will have kinetic energy. What that means is whenever my dog starts chasing the frisbee, he has kinetic energy. So watch his kinetic energy as he catches the frisbee. That's a lot of kinetic energy. I had to slow that down and of course it made for some interesting special effects as he was moving so fast. Another example of kinetic energy is electricity. And for most part, we think of electricity as the movement of electrons through a circuit. However, electricity can also be the movement of basically any ions. So as you can see, it's kinetic energy because things are moving around. Related to electricity, is the electromagnetic spectrum, of which light is one very tiny part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So what exactly is light in the electromagnetic spectrum? The electromagnetic spectrum, that's basically photons, which are small particles of energy. They're not particles of mass, but these photons, they move in waves, and the wavelength is the distance between the two tops there. So you can see the red light has a longer wavelength than green light, and green light has a longer wavelength than blue light. This is important because the longer the wavelength, the less energy the electromagnetic spectrum would have, or the photon to be specific. So that means that blue light has more energy than red light, and that makes sense, because you know that ultraviolet can cause skin damage, but infrared basically can't cause any damage to you at all. Because of the wave-particle duality of light, meaning that the light we see is actually made up of small, tiny packets of energy called photons moving through space, they don't need a medium to pass through, unlike sound waves. There's no sound in space. It's dead silent. However, light can travel vast distances across the universe because it's moving as a wave as a particle of energy. Just something that's kind of interesting to know. Another form of kinetic energy is thermal energy, or heat, which we measure as temperature. When you're looking at this fire in this picture, fire is actually a transformation, potential energy into heat energy. And temperature is just a measure of the overall kinetic energy of the system. Another example of this thermal energy would be the random motion of air. Air particles are actually moving around quite rapidly. And the hotter they get, the faster they move, but we can't use it to do any work because the air particles are moving in very random motions. Now, if it becomes windy, that's a different matter, and all the wind particles would, in that case, move in one direction. Here's an example of, quote, a thermally agitated protein. Now, what that really means is proteins will denature if they get too hot. And when you get too hot, you're adding more and more thermal energy, which means at the molecular level, these things are moving faster and faster and faster, and at some point they move so fast, they can no longer maintain their shape. At that point, a protein denatures and loses functions. And if you've ever cooked that egg, you know that cooking the egg, those proteins permanently denature, which can be bad for us if our proteins were to permanently denature. 
The next type of energy is potential energy. And the easiest way to think of potential energy is the energy that's stored, or we can also think about as the energy possessed by a body due to its position. Here's an example of pizza. Now those of you that know me know that pizza is one of my all-time favorite foods. So I'm always using pizza as a good example to show potential energy. Like the pizza, this coal are both storing their potential energy as a special case of chemical energy. Chemical energy is a form of potential energy. The way you store energy is in the bonds of the molecules. So a carbohydrate like glucose or a triglyceride or a protein for that matter, they store potential energy in the covalent bonds between these molecules. So once again, I've got the equation for cellular respiration. It's the overall general equation. And I'm taking carbohydrate, reacting with oxygen, and we're breaking it down into carbon dioxide and water. This is an exergonic reaction, so it releases energy as heat. But in cellular respiration, we also transfer some of that energy to ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. And ATP also stores chemical energy and high energy bonds between the phosphate molecules. Now in my next lecture, I'll cover how that works with the ATP molecule. Water behind a dam also stores lots of potential energy. If you were to put something behind the dam floating on top of the water, you wouldn't think the water is moving around that much. All the water molecules are moving around randomly. But the water has potential energy due to its position. And if you notice, that water is way higher than the surrounding area behind the dam. So it's got gravity, which is pulling it down. Now water can flow through the dam and it can be used to turn a turbine and generate electricity. Now this analogy is very important, this water behind a dam. You see, whenever we have a concentration gradient, there's potential energy stored, especially if it's across a membrane. It's the same thing. Think of the dam as a membrane with all the water on one side, or inside of a cell, you have all the, all the solutes on one side. And like the dam and the water behind it, you can use that to do work. If you have a concentration gradient with more solutes on one side of a membrane, you have potential energy, you can use that to do work. And then as they diffuse down there, concentration gradient, they will eventually reach equilibrium. And once that happens, you can no longer do any work. So if you had a dam with water on equal levels on both sides, you couldn't do any work. To make an important connection with cellular transport, it is active transport, like the use of a sodium potassium pump that helps cells store potential energy across their membrane. These sodium potassium pumps are pumping sodium out of the cell and pumping potassium in the cell and they're doing it in a three to two ratio. So that creates a slightly positive charge on the outside and a slightly negative charge on the inside. And this electrochemical gradient is a source of potential energy that the cell can use to do work for a great many number of things. And this electrochemical gradient, that's similar to water behind a dam. So the water wants to flow downhill and reach equilibrium. Well, all of these ions, they wanna be in equilibrium with themselves. Recall back to the first law of thermodynamics, and it said, you can't create or destroy energy, but you can transfer it, and you can transform it. So, the two forms of energy can be converted between each other. You can convert potential energy to kinetic energy. So if you have a ball at the top of the hill, and it's just hanging there, it has potential energy, and once you release it, it rolls down the hill, gaining kinetic energy. So as a ball rolls down the hill, potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. Diffusion is the same way. If I have an electrochemical gradient and things are gonna diffuse down their concentration gradient, I'm converting potential energy to kinetic energy. And like I said, cells use that to do work. And when you have a concentration gradient, always remember that is low entropy. And as you reach equilibrium, the entropy increases. So you haven't lost any energy you just lost the ability to do work. And lastly, chemical energy can be converted to heat and light, which is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when you see a fire like this, what's happening is the cellulose, or whatever it is you're burning, the potential energy is being converted to electromagnetic energy.